Karen at the introduction. Uh, my name is Punar Karajamandic. I'm a professor at the Carlson School of Management in the Department of Finance. I am also the academic director of our Medical Industry Leadership Institute, our MILI. Um, I'm a health economist by training and the area of social determinants of health and their role in driving up healthcare costs is a deep, passionate topic for me um, and my research. Um, we are so uh, happy that Kurt Waltenbaugh is here to join us and lead our conversations and present us a webinar on that very topic of social determinants of health. Um, I want to give a very brief introduction of Kurt and then I'll give the floor to him. Um, Kurt is a founder and the CEO of Carrot Health. Um, he is a serial entrepreneur with a career focused on consumer. Primarily, uh, his focus is on using data to predict and influence behavior. And uh, through this vision, Kurt has built many successful analytic solutions, uh, products and companies in healthcare, retail, education, and other credentialing industries. Um, Kurt, before Carrot Health, was most recently uh, responsible for product strategy at Optum, part of United Health Group, building data analytic businesses for the provider, payer, as well as the employer markets. And I also understand that uh, Kurt uh, enjoys uh, the Minnesota winter, and he plans, uh, he's planning their next winter camping trek into Minnesota's boundary waters. Um, another very important uh, Carlson proud factor for us. Uh, Kurt has an MBA from the University of Minnesota Carlson School of Management. Um, now, just a few words about Carrot Health as well. Uh, Carrot Health is in Minneapolis, a consumer health and data analytics company, and uh, they really put the consumer at the center of US healthcare system. Um, they, they have a lot of solutions to measure social and behavioral data and the variation in consumer behavior to predict health behaviors and, and outcomes. Um, one important thing about Carrot Health, uh, uh, October 9, uh, in 2018, uh, Carrot Health was um, named the winner of the Life Sciences and Health IT Division of the 2018 Minnesota Cup, uh, sponsored by and organized by the Carlson School of Management, and they were a runner up in the overall competition as well. Um, another personal anecdote, research anecdote with my uh, interactions with Carrot Health is um, as COVID-19 was folding um, or unfolding, I guess in March, back in March, um, uh, Carrot Health was actually one of the first companies to, to jump in and, and look at this. And uh, in particular, uh, they were creating these really interesting maps uh, and identifying counties that more risk and more vulnerable for COVID-19 risk. And I know they've expanded that work in identifying high risk groups, as well as uh, prediction, predicting populations at more risk. Um, so we couldn't really think of a better partner for a Millie webinar, uh, uh, a company that is uh, really deeply looking at consumer behavior, consumer vulnerabilities, disparities in healthcare and, and social determinants of health. Um, so with that, I will um, have Kurt start our webinar. Um, one thing that I wanted to say um, as sort of the floor rules is uh, we would really like questions from you throughout this webinar. And um, we would encourage you to please use the chat option, the chat box, and I will uh, monitor the chat box as well as Kim Choi, uh, Millie's program administrator, who has done a fantastic job putting together this webinar. Um, and so we will um, be presenting, um, interacting with Kurt throughout the webinar as your questions come in. So please don't be shy, uh, ask your questions. And um, yeah, with that, uh, Kurt, welcome. And we are looking forward to hearing about you and your work. Thank you, Panar. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's exciting to be back uh, here virtually at the University of Minnesota and sharing a little bit about, uh, about our work at uh, Carrot Health over uh, the last uh, six or seven years. I'll, I'll start just by talking a little bit about how we do what we do and then you know, use that to get to ultimately the return on investment of, of investing in uh, removing barriers to health, the, what we have commonly called the social determinants of health. You know, Carrot's a company that focuses on transforming consumer behavior data into intelligent action. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. 
Um, the difference between passively and actively generated consumer data to better understand the behavior of the consumer, how we measure return on investment in practice. Uh, a couple of examples here uh, where that data has been used to both identify and remove a barrier and produce a positive benefit for the consumer as well as the, uh, the health industry. We'll talk a little bit about public health and safety and how that's influenced by race and ethnicity and other, other factors which we shouldn't ignore in the, uh, the analysis of risk across the community. And then finally, putting it all together, how do we use that uh, process to identify community needs, both in a population of individuals as well as individual hotspots? And um, so we'll kind of go through each of, these, each of these in turn. But really the best way to understand uh, how this information is useful from a health setting is to look at two patients and look at the variation in consumer behavior and how that variation in consumer behavior translates into uh, clinical behavior and ultimately into medical spend. And so we have two individuals here that we use, um, and this is, is an example I've used in the past, that came out of a, a pre-diabetic cohort uh, that Carrot studied for, uh, uh, for a large health system. And I like these two individuals because they live in the same zip code, they're the same age and same gender. So at, at the outset, we have the same baseline actuarial risk, right? If I'm looking them up in a, an actuarial table to sell life insurance, we'd start with the same price. They also have had, uh, over the course of the last 12 months, uh, one office visit apiece uh, with almost identical uh, lab results. Uh, first time high blood glucose readings, putting them in a pre-diabetic status, they're slightly overweight, high blood pressure, relatively uncomplex uh, pre-diabetics, not too uncommon for men their age, uh, rising risk to be sure, but the challenge we have in the health industry is that if I run them through a, a claims or a clinical-based risk model, because they have the same inputs, we're going to get the same score, right? And that score will suggest that because there are quite a number of individuals at this, uh, this risk factor, risk level, the typical response we have in the industry is to ignore them. We wait until one or both become sicker and then we intervene. And that, from our perspective, is upside down. Uh, so we took a look at their consumer behavior data to say, what is it about their lifestyle, their behavior, the environment that they live in that might inform that prediction? And what we actually see is a 900%, a ninefold difference in medical risk, uh, spend risk over the next 12 to 18 months. Why is that? Well, this gets into uh, some of the factors which relate to social determinants of health. Jim on the right is showing high signs of social isolation and loneliness. He's divorced, he lives alone, uh, he does not uh, spend money on fitness products or travel. He's a sporadic voter. Uh, as we head into, uh, I think we're six weeks from today before our, uh, our next election, so thinking about voting, uh, we find that voting record is actually correlated with uh, health and connectedness in the community. People who vote the most frequently tend to be more connected to their friends and family and neighbors, more civically active. Those people who vote the most frequently are at less risk of social isolation and loneliness. Jim is a sporadic voter, if at all, which suggests that uh, that's a red, another red flag. A number of other factors on his record suggest he's less likely to be engaged as a patient, meaning less likely to follow doctor's orders and also ultimately less likely to take steps to better his own health. So that puts him in our highest risk bucket. Matt, on the other hand, is married and has supported home. He spends money on fitness products. He's a frequent traveler, which is correlated with better health. He's a regular voter and he's a pet owner. And this is actually one of my favorite examples. What we find is that pet ownership is correlated with better health and dogs are somewhat better than cats. I think uh, uh, over the years I've been using this example, I've been told that I have now uh, caused the purchase of 11 dogs. So if there's the potential 12th out there in the audience, just let me know afterwards. Uh, what we find is that the presence of a dog in a household allows us to identify a cohort that, because they have to walk the dog, are slightly more fit than their non-pet owning peer group like Jim, and that lessens their risk. Uh, and so that allows us to, uh, to correlate a number of other factors on Matt's record and put him in a category that's, that's least at risk for managing uh, illness. And so if you look at the example of Matt and Jim at, at a person level and then scale that up to every adult in the country, 
that's effectively what Carrot's doing, right? We've built the, the first and the largest complete data set covering consumer and health behavior and integrated the two. Uh, and so that starts with data at a fully identified level on every adult in the country, 262 million adults now. Uh, and we use that baseline of information to stitch together more than 80 different data sources about things like voting record and pet ownership and shopping patterns and online behavior and other things. Uh, thousands of variables that when combined with claims and clinical data, publicly available data, market data and others, allow us to triangulate on, on health and health status. Geospatial data set is another interesting one. So for each consumer household, 125 million households in the country, we've geocoded that location and then calculated the distance from that home to the nearest grocery store, fast food restaurant, emergency room, primary care facility, dental practice. All those distances become very predictive about our behavior. How far are we willing to drive for care, for example? That, that's uh, typically our willingness to drive to care falls off dramatically after about two miles. After about five miles, it becomes a significant barrier to health, and we stop going to certain types of appointments. We can also tell you that people who live closer to a fast food restaurant than to a grocery store which provides fresh food, just that one data element gives us a 22% elevated risk of obesity in the general population. And then finally, the voice of the consumer, which we'll talk about in the, uh, as actively source gener uh, dated, uh, data, we actively reach out and ask questions of millions of consumers across the country to uh, better ascertain their perception of health, uh, which we use to augment the passively collected data. And so what does that mean? Well, if we're looking at a true 360 degree view of the consumer, what we know is that from lifestyle and behavior data, we can observe risks, right? Whether someone is a traveler or not, a voter or not, or pet owner, um, you know, that information can correlate with loneliness. Uh, transportation need can correlate with the type of vehicle someone drives if they have a vehicle at all. Uh, income, a uh, number of dependents, relatives in a nearby radius, all of those things are observed risks in the passive data. But there's also a self-attested component. I may show uh, signs of social isolation in the passively generated data, but the question of whether or not I feel lonely is a perception, uh, and that's a perception that, that only I can answer if, if asked. So surveying and asking people those questions are an integral component of connecting the dots between uh, the consumer passive data and the actively uh, collected perceived risks. Um, Kurt, one quick in, uh, in, interruption there. You know, the observed risks with, risk with the passive data you get from all these different kinds of sources. What is your thinking? I absolutely agree with you about the self-attested, self-reported data. You know, we already know it's very difficult for people to, you know, report data on themselves. I mean, at first, the technology is not always there, right? But then at the same time, when it comes to these social risk factors like loneliness or transportation, I mean, there are a lot of other implications, right? As to some people may feel very vulnerable, maybe even from a legal perspective, it may uh, put them at risk for deportation at times. And if they report on some of their social risks, what, what is your thinking as a company or you, know, you, you yourself as well as to the availability and feasibility of being able to get this actionable survey level data? Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent question. And, and the simple example that I use, my co-founder, who's a, a longtime emergency room physician, he said, when I ask somebody uh, you know, how much they drink alcohol, uh, uh, I typically triple the number, right? Because there's, there's a reluctance to share that actual amount uh, with, a, with a physician. And so you find a lot of these areas where we, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we self-report data that's not aligned with the observed data, uh, which is why it's important to capture both sides and allow us to triangulate the more, num the more different variables that I can connect the dots on around uh, loneliness, for example, the more likely it is I'm going to get to the, the right result. If we rely on just one instrument for that, uh, for example, self-attested risk, and someone doesn't uh, tell us the truth, then we ignore that and move on. But if I triangulate that with a number of other elements, for example, I see in the data that the person only shops online and never in a retail store. 
uh, that there is no uh, vehicle and no transit line near uh, the household. So the person also has a, a trouble getting out of the house. Uh, if I look at, uh, you know, uh, absence of pets and some other statistics, I can begin to triangulate around that data to understand what the more complete picture is of that consumer. And the models then will give us a much better, uh, much better risk score because we're, we're using more inputs. The key is just getting as much data as possible at the individual person level to be able to triangulate on the answer. Great question. Thank you. So when we, we look at all of this under the covers, we use what we call a social risk grouper. And this is a taxonomy uh, that we've uh, made available to measure social determinants of health and roll those barriers that we identify in the community up into a single factor. Uh, and we score every adult in the country uh, on a monthly basis predicting the risk of an adverse health outcome due to barriers that that individual person is facing. It's a unique fingerprint of risk underneath every score, and it allows us to track that at a longitudinal level so we can determine changes over time. What does that look like? Well, these are examples of some of the components that go into that social risk grouper. So we may say, here are two individuals, uh, you know, uh, Matt and Jim side by side, they may have the same social risk score, but Matt's may be caused by loneliness and food insecurity. Jim's might be caused by housing, housing instability and transportation needs. Knowing what that, that fingerprint of risk is, what the barriers are, uh, what are the things that are blocking better health, gives us the way to connect to the next best action at the individual person level and really help identify what we do to, uh, to improve the situation. Um, right? It's, one, it's, sorry, one more question. Sorry, yeah. exactly at that actionability, one of the questions on the panel, well, there are two related questions. One of them is sort of asking, you have all these insights on your end as Carrot Health, do you share them with organizations such as Minnesota Association of Community Health Centers or other organizations? And then the second question is really exactly asking, well, if you know this information, if you get this data, what are some of the actionable steps and interventions based on, the, on these data? Yeah, great question. And, it, and of course it does vary, right? It varies based on the capability of the organization, what resources are available in the community, uh, what the individual is willing to work on, and there are some ways we can get at uh, engagement propensity and what someone is willing to do, as well as the channel in which how to reach them. But in general, we, we envision this, we, we use this as a three-step process. The first is, let's just assess the opportunity in a community. What's the risk in this community, and where are the areas where we believe we can have the biggest uh, uh, return, the biggest return on our investment, for improving one or more of these conditions. The second is, what are the capabilities that are already deployed in that community, right? Do we already have a way to deal with food insecurity or deal with housing instability? And is it a question of identifying the right people to connect to those existing interventions? And then the third level, which requires a higher uh, level of maturity in, in that capability is to say what's missing in the community and where can we create the, uh, the investment need? Where can we create a thesis for investment that allows us to go in and solve one of these problems, one or more of these problems? Um, and we've got some examples that'll, that'll show uh, how that works, but, but effectively you're right. If there's no action that can be taken on a piece of data, well, you're almost better off not knowing it, right? Unless you're gonna do something about it. And so we're, we're very careful to try to connect the dots between the risk, the next best action, and what the capabilities are of the organizations in question. And often it takes a broader community that it's not just one organization on their own. We have to use the position of that organization in the community to create a team to, uh, uh, to connect a number of organizations to solve these problems. And fundamentally, some of these problems are long-term problems like uh, socioeconomic status that are going to be solved at a societal level you know, we can't say to, to your physician, uh, you know, why don't you go out and solve poverty for the patients that you manage, right? That, that's not uh, a, a useful, uh, useful activity. Although, you know, one extension of it could be things like uh, identifying, maybe identifying eligibility for social welfare programs or public health insurance programs, you know, that there are definitely some mechanisms like that. Indeed, and, and I think connecting the dots, so one of the, the conversations I had earlier today with uh, uh, an organization that was doing some advocacy work uh, is 
how do we connect the dots at a, a, a broader uh, state or federal level uh, if we begin using data like this to risk adjust our populations, right? It's not just looking at the retrospective medical costs. We also have to look at what's the burden in your community of housing instability and food insecurity. What's the burden in your community of uh, transportation needs and employment issues? If we begin using that information to understand that those social risks are preventing people from being healthy, uh, I think we can have a much more nuanced conversation about where to invest our dollars and improve the, the health of the overall population. So let, let's look at a couple of examples. This is uh, an example on the health front of solving a specific problem. This happens to be looking at a population, happens to be a Medicaid population uh, on behalf of a Blue Cross plan, looking at emergency department utilization. And what we found, uh, there was a, a very high, there's a very high number of uh, ED visits within this community. Um, and specifically, the population that we were interested in were the, the super utilizers, people who had four or more ED visits in a given year. And so this lift chart on the right is a way we demonstrate goodness of fit of our predictive models. This model happens to be uh, ranking the population in deciles from most likely to be a super utilizer over the next 12 months to least likely. And what you can see is it's a very, very high lift over the random line in the middle. In that top decile, the top 10% that we identified to be most, uh, most likely to be a super utilizer, that captured 75% of the total demand within this, uh, this cohort. And in the top two deciles, we got that number up to 92%. So we can create a very target-rich population. On the left, you can see in the chart, in that top decile, over 30% of that cohort were actually super utilizers of the emergency room. That's 750 times more likely than the bottom decile, which has almost zero utilization, super utilization. In the bottom right, you can see some of the risk factors, social isolation, substance abuse, mental and behavioral health conditions, uh, high transportation needs. Some of the other factors that were highly predictive here are also called out. So, okay, great, we can identify them. Now the question is, well, what do we do about it? Well, the subsequent step was to analyze that top decile and say, why? What are the drivers of risk here? And it turns out there were two cohorts that were the primary drivers of that utilization. One cohort happened to be an older, frailer population with limited transportation needs. They were effectively shut into a home or facility and using an ambulance ride in an emergency room to get to any sort of care. Uh, that cohort was relatively easily dealt with by deploying a, a fleet of mobile urgent care vans to bring care out to those individuals and communities proactively so that they could get access to the care without, uh, without requiring the emergency room. Very significant cost savings. Um, the second cohort quick, was a young, oh, go ahead. So one quick uh, clarification question, is the utilization prospective to cohorting in this study? Uh, say that again? Um, the question is, is utilization prospective to cohorting? I guess uh, the, this question, um, uh, the panel, the, the individual asking about whether the um, utilization measures you have are based on um, a cohort ex ante or ex post. So the, yeah, so when we look at the, when we build these models, um, we are looking first at individual risk. So we're, we're providing this risk score at the individual person level and then building that up. The second step is to go in and to identify themes within the, the cohorts, for example, in this case, in the top decile of risk. What are the themes that we see in the data that differentiate that decile from the rest of the bottom 90% in this case? Okay. Uh, and that allows us to get to some of the some common demographic themes that we have labeled here cohorts uh, from from that perspective. And so that gets us to uh, the one cohort that was older and more frail. The second cohort happened to be uh, younger, single, typically male, and typically having a number of comorbid conditions that were undoctored. They had no primary care physician. They were managing their condition by going to the ER when things got got bad. That population is a much more difficult one to reach. Uh, we were able to connect with them through uh, pop-up urgent care that was deployed into community centers, food shelves, drug rehab facilities. 
What's been unsuccessful is converting that initial visit into an ongoing primary care relationship. So stay tuned as there's, there's further work to do there. And Curtis, I understand this is a cross-sectional study, so this is a one-shot because one, one uh, participant is asking about whether these superutilizers are the same every year. Are you able to look at them year after year, uh, and do they change year to year? Yeah, yeah yes, they do, and, and so that's a, that's a really good question. I don't have the data in these slides, but there is a significant variation year over year, um, and, and I do happen to know from another study uh, looking at total cost of care, if you just look at your top 1% utilizers, um, at one uh, county hospital that was about 60% Medicaid population, they had almost 100% turnover in that top 1% of spenders every year uh, because it's hard to maintain that level of spend, right? You either get, you either improve your condition or, or you become deceased um, are typical, typical endpoints. Uh, so we do see a lot of turnover in these cohorts and a lot of variation year over year, and trying to identify that before someone enters that risk cohort is really the really the key driver for us. So let me show you what that looks like through a study that we did in conjunction with the Colorado Hospital Association, really to connect the dots between hospital visits and social risk. And so the CHA uh, has over 100 member hospitals that vir cover virtually all of the state of Colorado. They have a platform uh, that they call ODIN, which has longitudinal access to hospital claims statewide at an individual patient level. We um, uh, took access to, to that platform of three years worth of patient data, 16 and a half million claims across two and a half million individuals. And we matched that up to the CARAT data, the, the social risk taxonomy, for social determinants of health uh, for every adult in the state of Colorado. And we looked at a couple of different things, but primarily emergency room utilization and hospital admission and readmission rates. There are a number of different components that go into that, uh, which I won't, won't go into a lot of the underlying uh, data and studies. Uh, but what I will show is the results here. This is mapping by county. Uh, the social risk grouper on the horizontal axis and on the vertical, uh, the ED superutilization per thousand residents in that county. And you can see there's a very clear relationship, uh, actually pretty high R squared of uh, uh, 0.53 uh, across these uh, counties uh, where we see that variation. Each one unit increase in that social risk grouper implies an ED superutilization rate of over 6%. Uh, and this sort of analysis is what gets us to uh, the uh, upfront assessment of where we think we can have the highest level of return on investment for, for creating an intervention to alleviate some of these conditions. What does that mean in terms of reducing the superutilization rate or admission rate or readmission rate? And how can a health system or other entities who are at risk in these communities, how can they identify where that need is and what that need is? The next step is to drill down from that high-level risk grouper into what is the factor which is mattering most. And in this, in Colorado, uh, you can see circled there in red, it's food insecurity. Uh, it, food insecurity over-indexed uh, against ED superutilization uh, uh, more than any other variable. Now, yes, housing instability and financial insecurity and socioeconomic status are right up there. But one interesting thing that's not up there, highlighted in gray down at the bottom, is the risk of COVID-19 critical infection. Uh, Pinar mentioned earlier some of our work on identifying who is most at risk of uh, becoming critical should they be infected with uh, COVID-19. Interestingly, that variable was not uh, important for as important for us in identifying uh, risk factors uh, within this hospital utilization. Uh, and so this is an example of how do we start at a community level and use that to, uh, to, to drill down into uh, to the overall risk factors. Um, Kurt, with, um, so this was specific to the hospital admissions uh, or the ED, right, ED. Have you uh, looked at some other areas? Uh, one of the participants is asking about, have you looked at opioid drug addiction treatment? Um, or, or, or what would be some of the ways you, you think this order or the hierarchy of the, 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 um, the types of social determinants of health may vary 
from one condition to another? It does vary community by community. In fact, we've done some work uh, out on the East Coast uh, with a, a health plan uh, managed care organization that is dealing with uh, significant impacts from uh, opioid addiction. And so we have uh, uh, models that are able to identify where uh, within those communities, who is most at risk of, of opioid addiction and how to identify them proactively before we start waiting to, uh, to see the, the downstream impacts. Um, that was actually a very successful intervention because it allowed us to take a, a very large population and narrow it down to five or 10,000 individuals that we could pay attention to uh, much more cost effectively than trying to do something at a, a broad brush, much larger cohort. And that I think is really the key message. It's each of us carries our own fingerprint of risk and each of us carries uh, a number of potentials uh, that if those barriers were removed would allow us to become healthier. Trying to understand what those are at the individual person level allows us to get down to a small enough cohort where we can, we can identify uh, uh, a profitable way, a cost-effective way to, uh, to intervene. The, these are some examples. I won't belabor these. Um, I think we have a way to, to get uh, slides out to people afterwards if you're interested, but we have a number of other clinical outcomes that are correlated to social risk. Uh, right? We see people who are food insecure have uh, twice as high prevalence of obesity and a 21% higher annual uh, healthcare spend. Uh, health, health, uh, housing instability, um, you know, 44% higher prevalence of obesity for those who are uh, in inconsistent or unstable housing situations. There are a lot of different ways we can identify what those barriers are and what the financial issues are. Uh, but how do we put that into practice? And I think this is where uh, we find some insights uh, from, uh, from the work that we've done to demonstrate a way to engage in a community and a way to spend resources that are a lot more cost effective than waiting for them to get sick and then spending to patch them up on the back end. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk through this example and then you know maybe we can, uh, there'll be some questions about it. This happens to be again with a Medicaid population looking at a, a 10,000 lives, uh, high spenders, uh, significant uh, chronic disease burden and relatively high uh, per member per year medical spend, screening that population for social and behavioral barriers to health identified a cohort about 20% that had very high food insecurity. The uh, uh, health system in question enrolled that population in a, a one year, a 52 week home food delivery program in partnership with Mom's Meals. Uh, and so those food boxes were delivered to those individuals, both fresh and non-perishable food, after accounting for the costs of delivery and the cost of the food, they were able to see a, a very significant positive reduction in uh, uh, spends, in clinical spend, net of food and delivery costs over $2,500 per year for that, the population that both enrolled uh, and engaged with, uh, with those healthy food boxes. In the literature, we've seen other studies which have shown up to uh, even higher uh, per member per year spend uh, savings, uh, depending on the the uh, level of spend that was coming in at the uh, the outset. How risky were were they as a as an overall population? But the example here is a really good one because this health system piloted this with three clinics across their organization, demonstrated that that return on investment was there, and then began asking the question of how do we identify everyone in our our system that could receive a similar benefit and using the data to help guide them for where to, to roll this out uh, system-wide. Great example of, hey, we can't just jump in and provide a food benefit to everyone on our Medicaid plan. How do we identify where that's gonna do the most good and, and go from there? Thoughts or questions on that one? Yeah, there is one question. I think it's maybe more of a methodology question. Um, uh, what's the attribution to the per member per year savings? So that's one question. The second question is, does the net ROI account for the cost of care at health and all of its plan stuff and resources? And I'm going to put another question on my own, which is, uh, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with, or, or are there, is there any literature that you rely on that kind of thinks about once you identify, I mean, in this case, 20%, you know, food and security, but like if you identify also a 20% or closer, like transportation barriers, like how does one go about 
prioritizing what to invest in? So we'll, we'll leave you with three big questions. Yes. Well, the first on the methodology. So from an attribution perspective, you know, typically we're limited from with the data we can get access to. So in, in this case, the spend is the spend that's accounted for within the health system that is managing the population. Any spend that's outside that's not visible to them, we can't count because we, we don't know what it is. So, um, you know, there are limitations and we have to pay attention to those limitations. Uh, and there are some examples coming up of, of what those limitations might be. Uh, but that, you know, for us, it's really a, a simple of can we get access to the data and what can we count? And that's, that's sort of the starting point. Um, as you, as you think about some of the, some of the other questions. Um, so Pinar, what was the second question? Yeah, the second question is about whether does the net ROI account for the cost of carrot health analytics plant staff resources? Ah, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's I don't yeah. know. It's an internal question if you want to pass on, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Thanks. No, that's good. Good. Um, so yes, so we do count the cost of of carrot health as as part of the overall cost when we're trying to come up with this return on investment. Clearly, the investment in the data and the investment in the analytics has to pay for itself. And typically at a pretty high multiple to be to be valuable. Uh, so that that's um, you know that's on us, right, to be able to make sure that our our models are good enough uh, to provide the uh, the targeting that gets to that high level of of ROI. So yes. And and the third question. Yeah. So when I said three questions, I like because the questions are coming up. My third question, <laughs> if you want to defer, it's fine. Uh, I can talk to you later too, but it's, uh, mine was more about prioritization. So, I mean, you have a host of social right. determinants and social factors, risk factors. What are some ways you prioritize? Um, and then I have another question that is sort of about how do you account for member turnover? Another sort of methodology question yeah. in these analyses. And um, yeah, so for, let's, uh, let's, let's leave it with, with that and we'll let you continue. Perfect. Yeah, no, the, good, good question. So as we, um, as we look at how to prioritize, that's a, that's a really interesting question because you're right. There are people who would score high for food insecurity and housing instability and transportation needs. How do we determine which of those things we intervene with? And it's, it's complicated. Um, you know, the, the, uh, we, we can't take a linear approach and just solve one problem without being cognizant of the, the interrelated issues across the community, right? Food insecurity, just uh, putting a farmer's market in a community that doesn't have access to healthy food doesn't necessarily solve the problem of people who are chronically uh, time poor who don't have the time to shop for healthy food and prepare healthy food for their families, right? So we, we have to take it in context. The other element that we use, again, of course, is data to guide us, and we look at who is more likely to engage and respond with a specific type of intervention. I may be food insecure and housing unstable, but I may respond more to the food insecurity question than I do to the housing instability question. Uh, and so part of that is meeting me as a, a patient, as a consumer, where I'm at, we use data uh, much in the same way that a retailer would figure out what types of offers would resonate with an individual to help understand what channels and what messages, what types of offers uh, will, will be responded to here. And that gets us to a cohort that not only has the need, but also will engage in benefit. And those differ from, from person to person. So that's another, uh, another interesting way to look at it. The, the final question on uh, how do you deal with members who pop in and out, that's a, an ongoing challenge, particularly in things like Medicaid programs where we see uh, a sizable cohort that pops in and out in some states on a monthly basis where they're allowed to pop in and out of the programs. Um, that does become a challenge for any sort of intervention and, and sustaining investment. Uh, not only at, at something like Medicaid, but even if you scale that up to employer-based healthcare, the typical consumer um, only, the typical employee only lasts three to five years within an employer's health plan, within an employer, let alone on the same plan with that employer. It becomes very complicated to try to invest in things that might take longer periods of time to, to intervene. We measure our uh, success of our, our health insurance programs on an annual basis. 
But you think of something like uh, childhood obesity, which takes decades to show up in adult onset diabetes, you're not going to solve that on a 12 month cycle. So, you know, we, we often do a thought experiment with our customers to say, what if we took all the money that's currently being spent in your community? We took it away from the payers, we took it away from the providers and the physicians, and we gave it to the county health board and said, here's your money, but you own these people for 30 years, now go spend it. You're going to spend it very, very differently than it's being spent today. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with how things are being spent uh, uh, on some of these programs like the one described here, but we are picking off the low-hanging fruit of things we can show progress in on a monthly or an annual basis because of some of those challenges of keeping people enrolled in the programs and when we're measured from a, a payoff perspective. And so I think all of those get back to, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could start paying for risk over a five-year time frame instead of a 12-month time frame? Wouldn't it be great if we could use food insecurity as a way to risk adjust our payments to, uh, to populations in need? These are some of the advocacy things that we want to, uh, to add into the mix as well. Yeah, and I think without me asking you, sort of address some of the questions that were popping up in the meanwhile about the long-term horizon in terms of, you know, uh, getting the return on investment and some yes. of these things, like a uh, 10 plus year period before you see a return as one of the participants put it and who pays for it, how, you know, during that yes. time, time period is very, very difficult. And one uh, specific question about this particular uh, case study this delivery program, uh, a couple of questions asked about, uh, was it the particular food groups? Uh, was it fresh food? Uh, you can say a few words about that too. And, and I'll- Yeah, you, so you can go on. Mom, mom's, yeah, I'll, I'll just say Mom's Meals has a lot of different programs and a lot of ways that there, and there are others uh, like them uh, in various geographies. Um, in this case, it included both uh, perishable and non-perishable food items, and it was delivered in a refrigerated box on a weekly basis. Uh, and so there was some assessment being done by the social workers that they had the capability to store the food uh, and, uh, and the, the capability to use the food. But in uh, very high participation rates, I think we saw upwards of high 80s or low 90 percent of people who started the program remained engaged in the program. Uh, and that also uh, helped uh, with, this, uh, with this population to show the benefit. Another example like that on, uh, you know, just to show that this is, um, I guess to put it crassly, this isn't just a poor people problem, right? Uh, and, and I use the example of a self-insured employer here because it was very shocking to leadership that 10% of their fully insured, uh, fully employed uh, population were screening positive for food insecurity. Uh, and, and that's something that is uh, not done frequently enough within commercial populations to understand what are the barriers to health that the employees are facing. Um, in this case, you know, kind of tracking within that, that uh, 10%, uh, they were spending significantly higher on just two variables that we were looking at here, ED visits and readmission costs, about $1,500 uh, per member per year for those food insecure, uh, which was much higher than the, uh, the, the bottom 90% post food intervention, and this was uh, not as extensive an intervention as within the Medicaid uh, world, but post that food intervention, uh, we were able to see that, uh, that spend fall by a third. That's a million dollars in potential savings for, uh, for this employer uh, scaled across the 10% uh, the that were food insecure. And so that's an example of where there are dollars sitting around in, in pockets that we may not be aware of uh, that can be used to fund uh, fund programs uh, uh, of this nature. Um, when you guys do screening or when the, the organization does screening for their employees or in the Medicaid that you mentioned, uh, one of the questions uh, is basically are you using sort of personal fitness or mobile device data? Because, you know, only a small fraction of the people are at any time in a hospital or a clinic. So how do you, what's the, could you comment a little bit on the actual data collection for the screening? Yeah, that's a great question. And I should be, the, the word screening here is a little imprecise. When I say screening, what I mean is we're using the carrot data to identify who is most likely food insecure. Uh, and so we're doing that behind the scenes passively without having to ask the question. In the prior case, uh, with the, the Medicaid population, 
that then creates a target list that the social workers then use to communicate with the individuals and to offer uh, enrollment in the program uh, once they've validated that uh, some of those conditions exist. In the commercial situation, it's a little different. We don't have social workers who are calling on uh, the, the, uh, the employees, uh, but it does allow us to reduce the population that we're outreaching to a cohort that is uh, uh, able to be reached in a cost-effective manner, so we don't have to go to the expense of uh, physically talking to everyone in the population. We can do that with a much smaller subset. So, I'll uh, any any questions on those examples before we go on to the next topic? I guess I just had one more question that pop out that says, "At Care More, I've seen about the same savings pre-post meals intervention on." readmission on an MA population, about a 36% reduction. So it's confirmatory with uh, some of your work. Excellent. Excellent. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. So let, let's talk a little bit about public health and safety and how that's influenced by race. This is a, a topic that's very top of mind for us in Minnesota, uh, you know, on the heels of, of the George Floyd murder earlier this year. And so one of the things that drove uh, me to do at Carrot was some digging into what are the risk factors within Minnesota and why is race highly correlated not only with the social determinants of health, but also with public health and public safety risk. Uh, and the, the chart you see here on the right is looking at Carrot data uh, for a number of social determinant of health risk factors like loneliness and financial insecurity and food insecurity. Uh, but breaking that apart between the white and the black population. Uh, and it's worth noting that Minnesota as a whole, uh, if you're averaging the whole population, is less risky on all of these dimensions than the national average. Uh, but when we break it apart by race, uh, and we could do the same here for uh, the, the Hmong community, uh, for the uh, Latinx community, uh, uh, Native American in, uh, population, uh, all of those communities are much more risky than the national average uh, across many of these dimensions. And so I think the challenge we have is that if we're having a conversation about moving upstream and addressing these barriers to health, we have to include race as a factor because the averages will mask that variation in a way that, that allows us to uh, oftentimes ignore it. Uh, and that, that's sort of our starting point here uh, within CARAT, we have published uh, our belief about modeling and, and how to treat bias uh, in that race is a variable. Uh, and you can see uh, I've, I've posted an article on this uh, publicly on LinkedIn, uh, links there if you're, you want to take a look at it. But in general, um, we try to ensure that our models do not have disparate impact across protected groups, race, gender, country of origin, and others. We look at uh, the data to ensure that models are not performing significantly differently across those groups and that our products are not used in such a way that causes disparate treatment, either intentional or unintentional, i.e. disadvantaging access to care. And those are sort of principles that we take away as a, as a company uh, that, that help us better understand uh, the behavior of the population. And I think a really Good example to use, again, just, just uh, to, to go deeper on the food insecurity uh, option, how do we get to what that root cause is and what that intervention might be? If we're hesitant to use race as a factor in predictive modeling, um, we can really be blind to a number of the, the correlated or related issues that would, are required to solve, right? So if we define food insecurity as the reduced ability to pay for or access healthy foods, we know there's a number of significant health impacts, some of those we've seen on prior slides. Uh, we know those who are hungry report the highest number self-reported on healthy days a month of almost any cohort. We know it varies by geography and that uh, individuals who live closer to a fast food restaurant than a grocery store live in what we call a food desert and have higher rates of food insecurity and elevated risk of obesity. But if our solution is to simply provide a farmer's market and assume people will make better choices or to provide a healthy meal service post-hospital discharge to prevent readmissions and then we walk away, that misses the complexity uh, uh, of the, the overall problem. Um, and so this is, you know, it's not just access to the healthy food that's the issue. It's also the financial insecurity that, that causes a household to prioritize cheap calories over expensive healthy food. 
Uh, it's the time poor single parent household that chooses fast over a laborious food prep. It's decades of racial discrimination that leave a community without the resources to address these food issues on their own. And if we if we take race out of the equation, if we take community out of the equation, we miss that complexity. Uh, so this on the right, this chart is showing again that risk of food insecurity at a state level, drilling into Minneapolis specifically, and then into the north side of Minneapolis, uh, into a community where we have high, uh, the highest concentration of, uh, of black residents versus white residents. And you can see the, the dramatic increase in risk that happens as we take that dive into that community, which would be labeled a food desert uh, by our prior analysis, but also requires us to be a little more nuanced in thinking about how we, we bring the community together to solve that, that problem. Um, I'll pause there. Thought, thoughts on that or, or how uh, race is used in your own organizations? Um, no, they're very interesting, very interesting work and, and, and the way to think about race and how we incorporate in our analysis. I mean, that's in the research world as well. We, we think about that a lot and, and measurement of race is something else that we think about a lot. Um, and also, um, you know, sometimes multiple race, for example, how do you define and how are you going to categorize people who report multiple race. Um, so one of the questions here I had uh, from a participant on where do you access race data? Um, I don't know if you use just sort of more demographic data, bet, data sets like the American Community Survey or if you could comment on that. Yeah, so we're, we pull that information from a variety of sources, multiple sources and triangulate. So we're, we're modeling based on a number of inputs uh, because there is not a single source that we found to be reliable enough at the individual person level. Uh, and so that allows us to, to address some of those, those complexities of uh, multi-race and what does someone uh, uh, perceive their own race to be, uh, as an example. Um, and that allows us to use the data to kind of uh, collect a cohort that behaves in a similar way and might might resonate with that uh, that designation uh, in a way that is useful for our analysis. Um, it is not uh, you know 100% accurate, so we do want to make sure that we take it with a grain of salt, like we do with all of our models. But it gives us a, a better way to evaluate than uh, just relying on pure self-reported data or some other source. No, thank you. I, so, I'll, I'll let you continue. The, just the general questions that people people are asking for you as you find fit in your presentation to answer is, um, you know, there seems to be an interest to know whether you have an ROI range that you're comfortable in reporting. Is it like one to two, one to three? And then the other question, again, sort of like a synthesis of all the work that you do and the different types of data sources that do you have a, a single predictor that is sort of sort of popping up or, um, yeah. There is no one single predictor. I think that's the biggest lesson is that these, these models vary. Uh, we've talked about varying person by person. The other thing which we haven't really addressed, they vary region by region as well. Uh, we have a model that was very strongly performing in Illinois in the Chicago area uh, within a senior population. We applied that model out of curiosity to a senior population in San Antonio, and it was negatively correlated. Um, and so what we find is we have to tune these models to the specific region in question because access to health, the health options, plan benefits are so incredibly localized. Within the Medicare world, for example, we track over 2,600 unique markets in which Medicare uh, is sold. Uh, Medicare Advantage or Medicare Supplement plans, uh, prescription drug plans, and each of those markets varies dramatically in, in how seniors relate to them and what types of, uh, of products they purchase. So tailoring and tuning that is, is really, uh, really uh, 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 quite important. On the return on investment, um, I will say we bias it towards trying to solve problems that have a high return on investment. And it I can't put a single range on it because it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. For example, we have one customer in the Medicare Advantage space we've been working with for several years. That customer was able to 
improve their star rating measurements from three and a half to four stars. As people in the Medicare Advantage world know, that has uh, tens of millions of dollars of, uh, of revenue grants on the line uh, for making that jump. It was, you know, if I, if I put a return on investment number out there, um, you know, you would laugh at me and tell me I underpriced the product significantly because they had such a high return on investment. Uh, now, we're not the only investment they made to get there, but, you know, when we're talking tens or in some cases, some of the larger plants, hundreds of millions of dollars on the line uh, for that type of, a, a, of intervention, uh, closing those gaps in care is very, very uh, uh, profitable. Uh, for other elements, you know, if you're getting into something that's higher cost, like providing uh, housing options, you know, we've seen uh, people like Kaiser make some incredible investments in the Oakland area within their homeless population. Um, they're doing that more as a charitable exercise than a, uh, a financially driven exercise. There are financial benefits to Kaiser and the health plan and the community. Uh, but the cost of housing and maintaining that is so incredibly high. I'm not sure there is a, a, a profitable ROI for a single payer to, uh, to get involved in. Uh, so there is a, a very dramatic range there, and it really depends on the question we're trying to answer. And the, and the clinical area. So, Kurt, uh, we have a few more minutes. I know there are a lot of other questions, so I would uh, like to know, is it okay if, uh, the, if anybody would like to ask you more questions, they could maybe direct Let's right answer the us. questions. Yeah, that's, right, that's right great. Let's do us. that. Um, um, yeah, because <laughs> we ran out of time on such an interesting, such an important topic. Um, I guess one other question I have here is whether you could share a few examples of the regional variation and what are the source of these variances. And maybe that's the last yeah, question we can that, answer before we end our webinar. That, no, that's a, that's a great question. So if you look at, at uh, regional variation, um, you know, some of that uh, we see cultural variation. So we've seen, for example, in um, uh, families uh, on Medicaid in Texas, for example, there was a culture of seeing long wait times in the emergency room as sort of a badge of honor, uh, which is an interesting perception. But we saw people who were willing to wait three or four hours to get care for their children in the emergency room were seen as being good parents. Uh, and so the lengthy, the advertising around lengthy wait times, the messaging around going to urgent care or diverting to some other other plan actually had the, the opposite impact. Um, it kept people thinking, well, the ER must be where the quality care is. That's where one wants to go. And so I'm going to take my child there. Uh, that was very different from uh, other areas where we've, we've had success with messaging around wait times as, as diverting care to other, uh, other types of sources. So that would be a, a cultural example. Some examples are related to the types of products offered. And I think the starkest example if you look at Medicare Advantage, we have some uh, communities that are incredibly competitive, many, many uh, plans offered, Miami-Dade County in uh, uh, Florida, for example, or the Philadelphia region uh, uh, in the Northeast. Uh, very competitive, lots of Medicare Advantage plans and penetration. Seniors tend to know what the plans are, and they're gravitating towards zero-dollar plans. If I look at Monterey County, uh, south of San Jose in the California region, um, we see fewer Medicare Advantage plans and much lower, I think it's the lowest actually nationwide penetration of Medicare Advantage, but seniors there are willing to pay a premium for more benefits. Uh, part of that is due to a socioeconomic uh, uh, difference between uh, Miami and Philadelphia and, and Monterey County. Part of that is just related to uh, the types of plans and benefits that are offered. Seniors are more accustomed to, uh, to buying those, those richer benefit plans uh, in those locations. And so while that's based on what plan am I going to buy, we see that carry over into how those seniors are behaving in their consumption of care and how they interact with the health system, how they interact and think about their own health and understanding which population we're dealing with and how they're relating to those, uh, those opportunities really helps us uh, determine how to intervene and what types of risks are going to be ad addressed more, uh, more readily by, uh, by those plans and the, the communities they live in. So it's definitely not a one size fits all story here. <laughs> very, very complex. Correct. And uh, the more data Correct. we have, the more we can understand the populations and communities in need and 
and the more we can um, prioritize some of these needs is, is the way to go uh, going forward. Well, uh, thank you so much, Kurt, for joining us. And this is really an enlightening seminar for me as well. And I hope for the participants as well. Lots of questions. And thank you for your patience answering all our questions. Um, uh, we have Kurt's email and contact information. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to him if you have additional questions. Um, we're getting uh, lots of thank yous and great presentation, Kurt. Um, I will check with Kurt whether we are allowed to share your slides uh, on Millie's website. Um, we'll put a recording of this presentation. And again, please reach out to us and, and join our future events. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank Take you. Care.